I welcome all the uh, faculty and as well as um, students. Uh, I hand over to Dr. Kala and uh, Dr. Dashaini to proceed for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Dakshani, you want to say something in the beginning or we'll start with the case? Yeah, ma'am. We'll proceed with the case. Okay. So we'll start with the case. Okay. Children, start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Monika Shri, final year uh, from Kattavam Medical College, Coimbatore. I'm going to present the case on acute globular nephritis. A six year old male child, Master Karthik, who is first born to no, uh, non Kajanga's parents from Polachi. Uh, brought by the mother who is reliable, came with cheap complaints of coffee colored urine for two days, decreased urine output for two days, and puffiness around both the eyes since morning. History of presenting illness the child was apparently normal before two days. Then the mother noticed coffee colored urine and reduction in both frequency and the amount of urine passed since two days. He normally used to pass six to eight times per day, and currently he passes urine two to three times per day in reduced amounts. This morning, the mother noticed swelling around both the eyes after waking up, which gradually decreased as the day progressed. There is no history of abdominal distension, no history of headache, vomiting, bloody profusion, altered sensorium, convulsions, no history of abdominal pain, rash, joint pain, no history of fever and pain during refrigeration, no history of trauma, no history of drug intake, no history of breathlessness, no history of jaundice, decreased appetite, irritability, no history of upper respiratory tract infection, no history of blood in stools. Past history, three weeks back, the child developed skin infection in both the legs for which he was treated with topical mucorrhizal ointment and then the lesions got improved. No history of similar illness in the past, uh, no history of tuberculosis, asthma, seizures. Antenatal history, uh, can, I hold on, hold on. can you please hold on? Yeah. So, in the presenting complaint and history of presenting illness, you've said three main complaints, right? Yes, ma'am. Dark colored urine, decreased urine output, and puffiness. Okay. So, can you give us some causes of high colored urine? Uh, high colored urine, there can be glomerular cause and non glomerular cause, ma'am. Glomerular cause, uh, uh, there can be uh, acute glomerular nephritis, where the color of the urine is. Uh, uh, coffee color or cola colored urine. In non glomerular cause, uh, that can be uh, red in color. Uh, the causes are um, renal calculi, uh, renal vesicles, idiopathic hypercalciuria, hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, and uh, because of the drug intake, it comes in that will be orange colored urine and uh, red in So, when you are talking about high colored urine, it is not always blood. It could be other causes also, right? So those, whenever you discuss about high colored urine, it has to be those where you can see RBCs or you, there is an RBC and those causes where there is no RBCs, okay? And there you have the pigments, the drugs, hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria. And then the if you have proven hematuria, then it is either glomerular or non-glomerular, okay? Yeah. Dr. Nandini, I mean, Dr. Monica, yeah, um, as Madam uh, mentioned, uh, you have uh, stated that it was coffee colored urine. Yeah. <coughs> um, how did you make out if it was hematuria or hemoglobinuria? Uh, hematuria. Uh... Is there a difference between the two or uh, is it essentially necessary to elaborate if it's hematuria or hemoglobinuria. Yes, You've stated that the urine is uh, coffee colored yes, um, or otherwise commonly cola colored. Yes, what does that tell you essentially? What is it essentially necessary to elaborate if it's hematuria or hemoglobinuria? Mama, in uh, hemoglobinuria, the, it will be red in color, no? bright red in color. And, uh, in hemoglobinuria? No, no, no. Are you uh, stating us it otherwise? No. Uh, Hematuria literally means blood in urine, which means you have frank, I mean, RBCs in the urine. RBCs in the urine. Hemoglobinuria means the RBCs have lysed and it you have, be. yeah. It means that it has uh, been there for a while. 
and it essentially means that uh, there is an element of glomerular inflammation and glomerular injury the injured glomerular basement membrane uh, when it allows the rbcs to pass through the rbcs while passing through the uh, injured glomerular basement membrane they negotiate and they are deranged they become dysmorphic the dysmorphic rbcs cannot stay as such for a longer time so they get lysed and this lysed rbcs give a picture of high colored uh, i mean uh, cola colored or coffee colored urine when the rbcs are passed as such then you will have hematuria okay so uh, by stating that uh, the child has coffee colored urine or cola colored urine you mean to say that the child has suffered a glomerular insult right yeah stop here yeah yeah um okay uh, dr monica can you go back to the um, antenatal history okay so um, basically this child is a 6 year old child and we know that we are presenting a case of acute glomerular nephritis but uh, the common uh, mimic of acute glomerular nephritis is going to be nephrotic syndrome we know for sure so in that case if this child this child is a, a relatively older child so 6 year old if this child uh, and the common what is the common age of presentation of acute glomerular nephritis age 5 to 15 years of age age in is it ma parama age ma Ah uh, yeah, five to fifteen years. Five to fifteen. Yes. Um. So, what is the common age of presentation of nephrotic syndrome? Ah, uh, two years now. Two to three years. Okay. So, the common age of presentation. Ah, uh, all uh, books say it is between ah uh, one to six years in nephrotic syndrome. Okay. So, five to ten in um ah uh, nephritic syndrome. So, ah, uh, if this child was a case of ah uh, nephrotic syndrome and this this child had been a uh, one year or a two year old child you will have to essentially um rule out infantile nephrotic syndrome because nephrotic syndrome is the commonest mimic of acute nephritic syndrome so in that case not this child in that case you would uh, put a more of emphasis on uh, the maternal history 
when uh, with regard to fever with rash in the mother why is it important torch infections ma'am yeah very good so torch infections as they say uh, like your uh, to toxoplasma rubella uh, cmv apart from that other ebv all those can cause fever and rash in the mother uh, which can be uh, causes of secondary causes of uh, infantile nephrotic syndrome so uh, that is important uh, if this child had been a case of nephrotic syndrome and this child had presented around 1 or 2 years of age and when you were really confused okay then uh, with regard to folic acid uh, if this child was a case of uh, a previous uh, um, birth which had terminated in a um, in a miscarriage or a death you never know what the cause of um, this death the previous uh, child being born dead or a miscarriage would have been so in that case uh, it is essential that you uh, state the amount of iron and folic acid taken because um, it is now recommended that uh, if the child if the mother has a previous miscarriage uh, or iud or otherwise if the outcome of the pregnancy has been a dead born baby it is recommended to take 10 times the dose of prophylactic folic acid whatever be the cause okay so uh, it's better to mention uh, the dose of when iron and folic acid had been uh, taken this child is uh, safe you are safe because this child is a 6 year old child and it is well into the nephritic range uh, you go to the next slide hello you go to the next slide the next so dr monica yes ma'am yeah uh, it is always better to state that the uh, child was vaccinated uh, according to the universal immunization program uh, why is uh, it important here Uh, because uh, if the child goes for nephrotic syndrome, in such cases we have to give steroids. Before that, uh, we have to give optional vaccines. Now, uh, that is not the case here. Um, apart from your uh, streptococcus, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, you have other causes which can cause post-infectious glomerulonephritis. Okay. One of the important causes. a b streptococcus pneumoniae yeah. so it could uh, it need not be post streptococcal but it could be post infectious in that case uh, if the child had not been vaccinated with the pneumococcal vaccine which means your uip universal immunization program does not cover pneumococcus uh, pneumococcal vaccination in uh, the state of tamil nadu so only five or six states across india have a uh, pneumococcal vaccination in their uh, local immunization schedule as a pilot project of uh, the government of india so uh, if you state that the child has been immunized until date according to the universal immunization program we believe for good reasons that the child has not received pneumococcal vaccine okay and the history Uh, yeah. No history of similar illness in the family. No history of inherited disorders in the family. There is no contact history and no allergic history. If the what if the child had, ma'am, no, proceed. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, what if this child had another sibling? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Monica, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm there. Ma what if this child had another sibling who had presented with a um, uh, similar illness? Child, uh, the sibling has the uh, hematuria. at the same uh, age of onset what would you think of and uh, if there is no systemic involvement like uh, phases and all we can think of palpots no palpots okay presentation will be early in okay what are the other components of palpots apart from your uh, uh, nephritis uh, sensory neural hearing loss ocular okay. defects uh, that is cataract Anterior lenticular. Yeah, good. Uh, this is basically because uh, you have a damage to the basement membrane. 
see uh, damage to the glomerular basement membrane causes uh, nephritis and the basement membrane of your uh, uh, cornea and the uh, inner ear causes um, a sensory neural hearing loss and keratoconus okay and if it uh, occurs in other members of the family if it has been hereditary you would think in terms of hereditary nephritis It can present as nephrotic also. Alports can sometimes later present as nephrotic syndrome also. Okay, go ahead. Prosaic novel history. Uh, the child lives uh, in a house with three rooms, paka house. Uh, separate bathrooms are present uh, with toilet, with adequate uh, sanitary measures and with clean water supply. Father's occupation, be gradual. He earns 20,000 per month. Mother's occupation, housewife. Um, he belongs to lower middle class three according to modified focus on the scale 2019. General examination consent was obtained from the mother. The child is conscious and oriented to time, place, and person, moderately built and nourished, mild failure present, periorbital puffiness present, mild fetal edema present up to the level of apples in both the legs, no interest, diagnosis, loving, generalized symptoms. Excuse me, Dr. Monica. Yes, um, like uh, basically in a pediatric examination, you do not comment on the build of the child. Yes, okay, so uh, because it is, um, you have another separate uh, um, channel, you will have a separate anthropometry, I believe. So it, uh, it measures the height, weight, uh, BMI, all that of the child. So you have a separate section and uh, generally you can talk about uh, the nourishment if the child appears uh, not so well nourished or uh, poorly nourished. Nourishment means that built uh, is something which is related to adults. We don't talk about the built in children. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, vitals, temperature, air to dry, pulse rate uh, was found to be 82 beats per minute with normal rhythm and volume. Respiratory rate, 18 breaths per minute. Blood pressure, uh, the child is. Uh, uh, the child was given adequate rest of three to five minutes. After that, uh, the BP was measured in the right upper arm in sitting posture, and it was found to have uh, 108 per 68 millimeter mercury. Uh, it falls under 98 to 96 percentile. Uh, this uh, shows that uh, the child has uh, elevated blood pressure and uh, partial pressure for which is 99 percent. Uh, hold on, Doctor um, Monica. Um, would this blood pressure reading? Um, it is appreciated that uh, you have measured uh, uh, the blood pressure, but is this sufficient enough to term that the child is hypertensive? No. What is the present recommendation? Uh, three, uh, three readings should be taken in each occasion. Two readings should be taken now. Totally three occasions. In each occasion, two readings should be taken to call it as the hypertension. Okay, so you, you have stated that this uh, blood pressure falls within the between the 90th and the 95th centile. Uh, is this hypertension per se? No, so she's asking what you, what you call hypertension. It? Yeah, um, what is hypertension? Yeah, yeah, uh, hyper uh, there are two stages stage one and stage two hypertension. Stage one hypertension is 95th. Uh, uh, center and uh, 95th percentile plus 12 millimeter mercury is uh, stage one hypertension. Stage two is above 95th percentile plus 12 millimeter mercury. So this is between the 90th and 95th. Would yes. you term this child hypertensive or pre-hypertensive? No, no, elevated blood pressure, no? okay. not hypertensive. Yeah, but still for all practical purposes, because this child is an acute nephritic syndrome and you have hematuria, edema, uh, this is not in the normotensive range. Yes. So for all practical purposes, we have to consider this uh, as above uh, normal BP, but this is not essentially in the hypertensive range. Yes. Okay. Uh, head to toe examination, head normal size and shape, hair shiny and luster, Face, periorbital puffiness present in both eyes, no manner rashes, eyes mild failure present, no interest, nose normal, ears normal, oral cavity dentition normal, tonsils and throat normal. 
excuse me dr monica uh, would you look for a uh, uh, would you grade paler in the eyes you just say that the child is anemic or not you look at the where do you look for paler in the eyes and in the eyes lower palpable conjunctiva okay for ictus uh, upper palpable conjunctiva okay so you look at the eyes and uh, say whether the child has paler um, relatively anemic or not or if the child has paler or not only with the um, i am in say according to i am in say only by looking at the palm of the child you grade arbitrarily semi quantitative you estimate whether the child has mild uh, no paler some paler or severe paler okay yeah umbilicus normal in position abdomen normal not distended genitalia normal no edema spine normal no deformities extremities mild paler edema present up to the level of cancers in both the legs skin multiple pyodoma scars are seen in both the legs joints normal no swelling okay if this child on general examination had uh, some kind of a uh, for puric patches over the buttocks and the lower limbs what would you what think you of, uh, cannot think of pardon cannot call it purpura so how will that purpura be how how do you describe it palpable palpable purpura over the skin itching palpable purpura mm. and more on the dependent areas the gluteal areas and the lower limbs so, anthropometry uh, observed weight was found to be 21 kg expected weight 20 kg uh, it was found to be normal height uh, observed height 114 cm expected height uh, 113 cm normal for age uh, bmi 21 it is uh, normal for age arm span 109 cm upper segment 62 cm lower segment 32 cm upper segment is to lower segment ratio 1.161 normal for age systemic examination uh, abdominal abdominal examination inspection uh, shape of the abdomen normal uh, flanks free umbilicus normal in position all quadrants move well with respiration no visible veins scars and sinuses no visible marks and corneal orifices what is the normal shape of the abdomen um it is scaphoid you mean to say this child with the acute nephritic syndrome with the edema uh, will have no free fluid in the abdomen absolutely no free fluid shall i proceed now yeah yeah palpation abdomen soft non tender no guarding cramp visibility no abdominal wall edema spleen non palpable Percussion, abdomen is resonant, no fluid print, no shifting dullness, body sign negative, liver scan 7 cm. Serious examination, S1, S2 pure, no murmur, respiratory exam, system examination, normal vesicular breath sound is heard, no added sounds, CNS, no focal neurologic deficit. In such a child, apart from the abdominal examination, what will you look for in the other systems? Uh, ma'am, uh, in a serious, uh, we look for tachycardia, ma'am. Why? Uh, in respiratory system, uh, basal crepitus, ma'am. Why? Why would you look for all these? Pulmonary edema and the serious, uh, the child can go for left ventricular failure because of the complication. And uh, CNS. In a CNS, uh, there will be cranial lumbalgies, ma'am. In case of uh, if the child goes for hypertensive encephalopathy. how common is that is that very common no. or something else no it's not much common shall i proceed now um uh, in the examination of the abdomen uh, would you look for examination of the back you palpated the um abdomen so where do you palpate for 
would you look for the kidney in this case or the spleen or the liver in this case uh, kidney why this uh, uh, spleen becomes important here uh, because if it if it is due to post infectious glomerular nephritis example like hepatitis that will be uh, hepatosplenomegaly okay so um an enlarged liver you think in terms of a hepatitis associated glomerulonephritis okay spleen uh, spleen mali uh, other infectious causes for example malaria okay would you think of infective endocarditis associated nephritis that is in the cause okay so Uh, spleen. Okay, you, you're happy with the spleen and liver. You do not want the kidneys. Where will you look for the kidneys in palpation? Where will you look for renal angle tenderness? Uh, at the back. Yeah. You will have to palpate the kidneys. You will have to uh, um, auscultate somewhere around the kidneys, right? Okay. For the blood, let's see. Bi-manual examination. So you look for bellotability, and you'll also look for renal angle tenderness, right? You look for a here. Look, uh, watch out for a renal bruit also. Okay, I think. Uh, Yeah, now, uh, Monica, you should uh, know where the Morris quadrilateral is situated. So, in the paravertebral region, um, from the level of L one to L five. Okay. So, which kidney is at a higher level? Right kidney one. Right is at a higher level, right? Are you right? I'm not sure, mom. <laughs> okay so that is the anatomical uh, surface anatomy of the kidneys okay there is uh, the point uh, the area wherein you will have to look for the uh, kidneys uh, because only then you will um, it should be situated within the morris quadrilateral from the level of l1 to l5 Uh, 2.5 and 7.5 cm from the mid vertebral line okay so it should lie within that so right is at a lower level than the left okay uh, so this should fit in within the morris quadrilateral and uh, if it is away uh, outside of the, uh, these boundaries you know it is apparently enlarged and alongside uh, if you have tenderness you know that there is some amount of inflammation in the kidney so probably your glomerular inflammation right summary a 6 years old developmentally normal moderately nourished male child immunized up to age belongs to lower middle class according to morris quadrilateral scale with the complex with past history of skin infection three weeks back came with chief complaints of ocular dimming and the decreased urine output for two days And periorbital toughness since morning. On examination, he was found to have polydermal scars in both the legs and mild bilateral fitting periorbital you know, up to ankle. Is probably diagnosed to have post-tetrabulbar glomerular nephritis. Okay, clinically, how did you come to this conclusion of post-tetrabulbar glomerular nephritis? Mama, tell me what prompted you uh, to think of PSGN in the history. What prompted you to think of PSGN in the Examination. Ma'am, uh, there is evidence of pyodermal scars, ma'am. Okay, history. I said. Uh, from the history, uh, three weeks back, uh, there is a past history of skin infection, followed by the child under the oligomia, a period of bitter toughness and uh, cola colored urine, and there is no history of uh, respiratory tract infection, which uh, rules out uh, IgA nephropathy, ma'am, and uh, there is no history of. Uh, Uh, rash, joint pain, abdominal pain, which rules out uh, Peyronie's colon porphyria, and there is a negative family history that rules out uh, Alport syndrome. Mm. And on examination, uh, 
liver and spleen is not palpable, which uh, rules out other infectious causes of blood infection. Okay, tell me one uh, a single point in the history that uh, you would vote for acute nephritic syndrome rather than nephrotic syndrome, because uh, this oliguria, edema, all that is common to both. And hypertension you may do after examining the child, right? So uh, just tell me one point with which you will go in favor of nephritic syndrome okay. rather than. Very good. So, of all the symptomatology, hematuria is seen in almost all cases of nephritic syndrome. Um, it is present in uh, almost hundred percent of cases of acute nephritis. Okay. If this child did not have any uh, impetigenous skin lesion, uh, would you not uh, think of? Would you not uh, entertain the? Um, Diagnosis of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Would you have any other uh, history suggestive of post-streptococcal origin? She wants. She she. The question is, is if there was no pyoderma history, if there was no pyodermic scar, will you still entertain a history? I mean, a diagnosis of post-streptococcal. That's what she asked. Would you want any other past history, Monica? You already said that. No respiratory, no respiratory tract infection. No, that you said for IgA nephropathy, preceding uh, uh, record uh, ARI. Every time ARI, uh, the child develops gross hematuria, then has microscopic hematuria. I'm not talking about that. If this is a nephritogenic cause, you have either a skin infection or what else? Monica, what uh, common infections precede post streptococcal glomerulonephritis? One is the infection of the skin, and the other one is. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 Very good. So, which are the nephrogenic strains for the skin uh, streptococcus, the commonest one? Oh, I am type. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, yeah. 49. Okay, and for the. 49 and for the it is 4 and 12. 12. 12 is the commonest. Okay. So, what would you do next? Next, uh, I will investigate them. Mm -hmm. Or. Uh, Seeing for any complications and uh, for the confirming the diagnosis. So, mm -hmm. first I go with the uh, CDV and then the urine analysis. In urine analysis, first uh, dipstick and then uh, microscopy. In the microscopy, we put the uh, RBC. Uh, the shape. Just a minute. How would you differentiate a glomerular origin? Uh, hematuria from a non uh, a lower down a lower uh, urinary tract hematuria. Uh, now here there will be presence of uh, R D C in uh, glomerular cause. Presence of R D C and there will be dysmorphic R D C that uh, normal morphology is maintained. Normal R D C morphology and there will be presence of cast R D C cast in glomerular uh, type and non glomerular type no cast. Mm -hmm. Then there are different shapes in uh, uh, glomerular cast. Okay, anything else? What will be the proteins in a glomerular? What will be the protein urea? Right? Yes, How will it go? No, madam is asking, how will you differentiate a glomerular protein urea and a tubular protein urea? Uh, what is the normal urine uh, urinary protein content? Some trace amount. Trace. Can you quantify? Uh, less than one. Okay. In a uh, so, syndrome, it will be around one plus to two plus one. Nephrotic is about three plus. Um. Selective proteinuria and non-selective Yes, ma'am. Uh, selective proteinuria is uh, there will be more albumin in the urine. 
non selective is uh, not only albumin and other uh, proteins also in why do you have selective protein urea monica some selective protein urea because of the glomerular injury uh, albumin is uh, not uh, uh, reabsorbed when they filtered through the membrane because of the glomerular injury so that be selective protein urea in uh, glomerular process there is something called a charge selective filtration oh. barrier okay and so the albumin is negatively charged and this glomerular basement membrane is also negatively charged so as they come towards the glomerular basement membrane they are repelled because they are of the uh, same charge but when there is a glomerular basement membrane injury this charge selective filtration barrier loses its negative charge so it attracts the negatively charged albumin and lets it to pass across and because there is gross injury or large uh, proteins uh, like your albumin and uh, proteins which are larger than albumin uh, they are filtered okay so that causes massive protein urea in your nephrotic syndrome okay so your normal protein excretion per day is less than 4 mg per meter square per hour then uh, after the uh, urine analysis i will do a renal function test to check for uh, urea and creatinine then uh, serum complement levels are checked uh, here if it is uh, nephritic then uh, there will be low c3 uh, and then uh, i'll go with azo titer and anti dns b um, then But what azo is positive high uh, generally very high in which kind of uh, uh, infections Ma'am, pardon me. Yes, so would be high in which kind of infection? Yes, or rather, would be high in uh, pharyngitis. Uh, Strain. Pharyngitis involved the glomerular nephritis. Ma'am, in uh, skin infection associated glomerular nephritis, yes, or will be normal, and the anti DNA B will be elevated. You said you will do a C three, right? What will happen to the C three? C three will be low, ma'am. Suppose you have a normal C three. So what what are the things you think of? Uh, normal C three, uh, we should think of other causes of glomerular nephritis. Okay, uh, like like uh, IgE nephropathy. Very good. Very okay. good. Membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis. <coughs> yeah, the other causes. Okay. What else will you like to do? any other investigations apart from these dr monica ma'am to rule out the pulmonary edema no though uh, there you are going to the complications yes, no, complication. no, when you go um, uh, when you would want to diagnose a um, case of acute nephritic syndrome first you will uh, make out that it is only acute nephritic syndrome and not nephrotic syndrome first you will have investigations to um, differentiate nephritis from nephrotic then you will have to uh, do investigations to confirm it is nephritis then you will do investigations to confirm the etiology of this nephritis here you uh, know for all practical purposes uh, it is post streptococcal uh, so when you want to differentiate this nephritic syndrome from nephrotic syndrome by looking at the urine per se would you have any clues it's from albumin level check for albumin uh, First, yeah, you put some cholesterol in the blood. Microscopy, can you make out uh, uh, any uh, differences? Protein. So first, you'll do a urine microscope. Hello. So just, just looking at the urine also, you can differentiate. That's what she ma'am is asking. Uh, ma'am, color of the urine, ma'am. It is very it is foamy, foamy in case of nephrotic, and the tears smoky or brown color. Okay. So first, you will ask the mother to collect a urine for a day, right? so that will tell you the volume of urine you know that it is oliguric because when the uh, volume collected is less than 1 ml per kg uh, per hour okay so you know the volume it is uh, oliguric then macroscopically when uh, it is appearing uh, red or cola color you know that uh, there is inflammation of the glomeruli so 
you know there that there is a nephritis itis means inflammation you know this is nephritic urine so when you have flocules or beaten egg appearance of uh, the urine you know it is it, it contains more of proteins so that could be a nephrotic urine okay so you know the volume you know the uh, color and uh, by that grossly you can say whether it is uh, ans uh, acute nephritic syndrome or nephrotic syndrome then you proceed with the urine microscopy okay microscopy as you said it could be rbc rb ca rbc cast uh, wbcs wbc cast epithelial cast all that is common with your uh, nephritis because in nephrotic basically it is in children the commonest is minimal change disease you don't have any inflammation so um, um, think about uh, rbcs and rbc cast wbcs wbcs are um a sign of inflammation in minimal chain disease you do not have much inflammation right so uh, all these uh, they you don't appreciate in a nephrotic urine rather you find more of flocules more of proteins different kinds of proteins in the uh, nephrotic urine okay so anything to do with your specific gravity yes ma'am how will this uh, will be elevated ma'am okay nephritic uh, because okay you'll have a concentrated urine, concentrated urine. Oh. okay yeah then okay so grossly you made out that this is only nephritic urine and uh, not nephrotic okay so how will you uh, further confirm with further investigations uh, azotiter anti dns b okay then the uh, serum complement levels okay so that is for your etiology um, you know what is the triad of uh, what is the biochemical triad of nephrotic syndrome nephrotic syndrome ma'am hmm. uh, anasarka and madam said you have massive protein urea so you are going to quantify the urine Uh, uh the urine protein okay so you quantify it as nil trace and uh, a 1 plus 2 plus and so on okay in nephrotic protein urea you will have 3 plus uh, or 4 plus which means roughly it is more than 300 mg per uh, mg okay so uh, at least this uh, urine the nephrotic urine will have at least more than 1 g okay Uh, but in uh, nephritic protein urea you will have either trace which means it could be trace or 1 plus uh, 30 to 100 mg okay so then you will uh, quantify the protein and uh, you can uh, uh, apart from that apart from quantifying your uh, protein uh, protein urea uh, it um, what is the other me metabolic parameter that will tell you that uh you have lost lots of protein in nephrotic syndrome you have lost your uh, protein in the urine and how will it be reflected in the blood what test will you do in oh, good okay what is hypoalbuminemia what is the level cut off uh albumin level uh pardon uh, i don't get you now can't hear you Albumin less than two point five gram per deciliter. Yeah, very good. So, so you have this metabolic uh, triad of uh, massive protein urea, hypoalbuminemia, and then hyper cholesterolemia. <laughs> very good. So you will have to mandatorily do all this because uh, uh, though you are sure that uh, this is uh, acute uh, nephritic syndrome, uh, there is. Uh, uh nephro even children with nephrotic syndrome other than minimal change disease which is 20% of uh, nephrotic syndrome they have nephrotic syndrome with significant glomerular lesions uh, that could be focal segmental or uh, uh, membrano proliferative yes. mesangio proliferative those pre those present with significant involvement of the glomeruli okay so you will have to essentially differentiate nephrotic from nephritis okay so you will have to demonstrate that the uh protein uh, level is not that much low in the blood the protein urea is not that significant as uh, in nephrotic syndrome and the serum cholesterol level is essentially normal okay ma'am anything no. 
Go ahead. Please go ahead. Monica? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now you go to the etiology, the investigations pertaining to etiology. That is what you said, acetotiter and C3 levels. Well, as Madam said, what if the C3 level um, is essentially normal? Why does the C3 level fall in uh, Aegean? No, no, here uh, there is an immune complex reaction uh, okay. which activates the complement system. That yeah. uh, immune complex plus complement uh, uh, protein, the complements, they go and deposited in the uh, global level. So they the deposition, so they drop in C3. Okay, so you have uh, an antigen uh, attacking the glomeruli, so the antibody is activated and the antigen antibody complex activates the complement system. So C3 comes in, sits with the complex. So this forms the complex. So which means the complement is being utilized. Okay, so when there is hypocomplementemia, the etiology is invariably infectious. Okay, so uh, if this uh, complement levels are normal, you could think of other causes, other non-infectious causes of glomerulonephritis. Okay, so secondary causes like your, uh, ra, ra, it could be even um, RPGN, it could be uh, due to secondary causes like vasculitis, uh, SLE, uh, HSP, PAN, etc. Those cases, they do not activate the complement because there is no, essentially, this antigen antibody complex. Okay, so... Complement levels, if they are normal, they tell you that the prognosis could be not so good in this child. Okay. In okay. all kinds of infections like infective endocarditis, shunt nephritis, also again your complements will be low. Okay. Not only for PSG. Yeah. Yes, Monica, proceed. Yeah, that's it. What are the investigations would you be doing, Monica? Other investigations, ma'am? Yes. Uh, ultrasound abdomen. Very good. Why? Uh, what would you discover in ultrasound abdomen? Uh, renal outline. Okay. And if there is any calculate present or not. Hmm. Okay, what will what be the size? So you can look for free fluid abdomen and you can look for the size and the configuration of the kidneys. Uh, here you will have a, a renal edema because it is inflamed. Basically, this is a kidneys. And uh, inflamed kidney will appear large. So the configuration uh, will be uh, enlarged. And the corticomedullary differentiation will also be lost because there is edema in, inside the uh, kidney. Okay. Okay. Anything else you would want to do? Um, uh, this child, if the child uh, progressed to any complications, then we can go for uh, chest x ray and ECG. Even otherwise, you will have to do a chest x-ray. You do an ultrasound, you definitely will have to do a chest x-ray. What will be the finding in chest x-ray? Increased your bronchodilatation because of the hyperolemia and the pulmonary condition because of pulmonary condition. Yeah. Will you have cardiomegaly? Uh, yes, cardiomegaly also in case of left ventricular failure. Okay. Uh, if this ch uh, this child luckily has not presented with any uh, of the complications, which means you stated, what are the common complications that are anticipated in acute uh, nephritic syndrome? Uh, left ventricular failure, pulmonary edema, hypertensive encephalopathy, and acute renal failure. Acute renal failure. Yes, okay, see, so these are the um, complications. So an acute LVF causing pulmonary edema, uh, hypertensive encephalopathy and this uh, acute renal failure, these are the common uh, complications anticipated in acute nephritic syndrome. Luckily for you, when it, the cause is post-infectious, uh, this does not happen so commonly. So when the child presents with uh, this a typical picture of acute glomerulonephritis and alongside complications, you, may, uh, you are in trouble. 
it is uh, something else it is uh, um, usually not post infectious cause okay it should be some uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or something uh, some glomerulonephritis which is uh, due to some other secondary cause okay um, so uh, that is the picture for you this child um, has come to you with no complications thankfully okay would you want to do a ct for this child in any uh, case would you want to do a neuro imaging not necessarily not necessarily okay, okay. this child has uh, uh, when will you uh, think of doing a neuro imaging in this child uh, you said you have done an rft electrolytes um you said you uh, will do an rft electrolytes and all that right okay uh, what if this child had complications of acute kidney injury or acute renal failure what would be the picture what would you expect in the renal parameters um urea and creatinine will be very good okay why because uh, there is a decreased uh, gfr gfr will be decreased Okay, so there is damage to the glomerular mm -hmm. basement membrane. The filtration capacity is lost. So, uh, all those which have to be filtered by the kidney is retained in the circulation. So, uh, the urea is increased. The creatinine could be increased. All your acid ions. Uh, so that might even cause acidemia. Okay, uh, your potassium that has to be filtered. So, the next thing would be if the child presents with acute renal failure, you would have elevated. Uh, urea creatinine and essentially potassium okay so why this is important because hyperkalemia persistent hyperkalemia and persistent uh, azotemia persistent acidemia are indications for dialysis in such children okay so that is why you do an rft uh, electrolytes and also essentially an lft okay um Okay, how will you manage this child? Uh, first, uh, uh, we will go for salt and uh, water restriction, ma'am. Okay. Then, the that child has come to you acutely. The child has come to you with the uh, uh, edema. Uh, the child is getting admitted. Diabetes. You have to give diabetes cure for one. Okay. Yes, so the child has uh, uh, only. Would you advise bed rest for this child? Mom? Would you advise bed rest for this child? Bed rest. So as I told you, this child has uh, thankfully come with no complications. Like mm -hmm. uh, there is no acute LVF. There is no feature of pulmonary edema. The child has no tachycardia, tachypnea. The child has no history of orthopnea or PND. Okay, so the child is uh, relatively stable. But if this child had presented to you with the uh, features of acute, Monica, okay. If this child had presented to you with features of acute LVF, then you would uh, essentially give bed rest for this child. Okay. Then, so I think. Uh, water restriction. Uh, How much water would you restrict? Yeah. How much water would you restrict? Huh? How, How much water much? would you allow for this child? How, How much water will you give for this child? Yeah. How do you calculate that? Uh, Ma'am, hmm. urine output uh, along with the insensible water loss. Okay. How much is the insensible water loss? What is insensible water loss? Uh, uh, respiration uh, through sweat, the water is so water loss by perspiration and respiration. Okay, uh, this is a six year old child. Uh, roughly how much will the insensible water loss be? So, the insensible water loss is age dependent. Uh, so for the infants, lose a lot of uh, water. Uh, the scalp has a large surface area and they lose a lot of uh, water. So uh, it is different for different age groups and children above 5 years of age, the rough estimate is 15 to 20 ml per 
kg per day. Okay. okay. So uh, the standard is 400 ml per meter square. It will be difficult to convert the uh, meter square uh, to the kgs into meter square. So roughly it is uh, around 15 to 20 ml per kg. Okay. And this child, as you said, it weighed 20 kgs, right? Yes, no. uh, yeah. So roughly if you would want to give 15 to 20 ml per kg, 20 into 20 is 400 ml for the whole day, insensible water loss. Then you will take, uh, you will strictly monitor the intake output of the child. This is very essential in all cardiac and uh, renal cases. Very essential in nephrotic and nephritis. Okay, So you uh, calculate the output. Um, if the edema is very gross, you will have to give only the insensible water loss. If the edema is mild to moderate, you would add the uh, urine output and the insensible water loss. If you have uh, induced diuresis by giving diuretics, then you will not take into account the urine output. Okay, because that will be a larger volume. Okay, so you uh, restrict water to insensible water loss and the uh, previous day urine output depending on the degree of edema. Okay, uh, what about salt? Why would you want to restrict salt in this child? Uh, Ma'am, uh, here already there is uh, uh, salt and the water reabsorption. Hmm. Uh, so that is hyperolemia. If we give uh, more salt, then uh, it will elevate the blood pressure. The patient can go for hypertension. So that mm -hmm. salt uh, in turn retains water. So you will have a hyperolemia, and uh, which may progress to hypertension. Okay. Then, what is the normal salt content of the food you eat? Does uh, I mean no added salt? Does it mean that the food does not contain salt? Uh, no, the food contains salt. The, uh, we have to restrict only the added salts like uh, pickles, pepper, uh, canned foods. Such foods, added salt foods alone, we have to restrict them. Okay. What else will you give if the child had more edema? What would you give? No. If the child's edema was a little more or his urine output was less, what, what would you give? Apart from the salt restriction and... Uh, diuretics, no. Pardon? Diuretics, no. Diuretics. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. One Which one diuretic? One. Which diuretic and at what dose would you like to uh, give? Furosemide for the first two days, one to three milligram per kilogram. And uh, after... Uh, uh, Two days we have to start with the uh, spironolactam if, if, if it causes because uh, uh, the child can go for hypokalemia. So to spare the potassium, you have to give us potassium spironolactam. Okay, this child is having normal BP at the time of admission. So are you happy that he is not going to develop hypertension at all? No, mom, he might develop. So we have to monitor the BP. So BP monitoring along with that is as important as the other things. Okay, some children might develop it even later. And how long can that persist? Hematuria and uh, hypertension can persist for how many weeks? Uh, two weeks. Two to three weeks. You will be lucky if that persists <laughs> only for such a short while. <laughs> It's much, much longer than that. At least 8 to 12 weeks is what we are expecting. The three months is what we say for both hematuria as well as hypertension in normal cases. Okay. So you would monitor, even if you discharge, you'll have to call him back for monitoring his blood pressure. Okay. What else is there? Anything else we need to do? Will you like to give this child some uh, antibiotics or something like that? No, antibiotics has no role. If only if the child has uh, an active infection, you have to give antibiotics. Otherwise, that's no What would you give? Mom? What would you give? Which child? The child? Active, if the child has active infection. Yeah, this child uh, probably has some uh, impetigenous lesions left. You are not too sure. Uh, we can give uh, the amoxiclab and the topical neuprozin or fusidic acid ointment. But no, we, do we give amoxiclab? Is that the drug of choice?
which drug would you like to give penicillin or erythromycin yes penicillin you can give okay it is not going to change the outcome of the nephritis but definitely if the child has got persistent lesions and persistent infections it would help for that to be controlled okay <coughs> excuse me okay so uh, now you have uh, suppose you have a child with a just forget this case just uh, trying to go away from post streptococcal if this child had a family history of some kind of uh, say alports you said about alports what are the screening tests you like to do for alports monica biopsy and what is it not a screening test man was asking about a screening test you do biopsy as a screening test you can be do urinary examination of the rest of the family in the siblings also okay and of course you will try to find out the other associated you will get an ophthalmic examination you will get a tnt checkup also done for this child and then you would screen the urine of the relatives okay 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 fine monica this is a clear cut case you had the you had oliguria you had hematuria and the uh, bp was high and uh, this child uh, is of the typical age group and uh, luckily had a history of pyoderma in the past so you have branded it as post uh, streptococcal glomerulonephritis okay hello monica yes ma'am ah uh, yeah so you know this is psgn here yes ma'am um, what are the conditions wherein you would want to do a, a renal biopsy to prove the etiology uh, if the even after 12 weeks if there is a low uh, c3 level that is hypocomplement anemia then okay. in such case we have to take biopsy and then uh, in the current uh, condition also if there is a normal c3 level we have to suspect Uh, and uh, if there is a persistent uh, uh, edema, hypertension, and azotemia, if the patient goes for uh, renal failure, and then uh, you say if the child develops complications, you will uh, do. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you said the persistence of symptoms. Then you will have to know when uh, until when the symptoms can persist, because uh, you have a natural course of the disease, as Madam said. some uh, symptoms persist for a longer time some symptoms if it is a uh, plain acute glomerulonephritis of infective etiology and for your information this uh, post infectious all those causes are now termed under the blanket of irgn infection related glomerulonephritis okay which is so if it is irgn or infection related uh, uh, glomerulonephritis you are safe you know that this uh, follows a course okay so what would you expect how would you expect the child to improve you have treated the child with bed rest salt uh, fluid restriction you have given diuretics for this child uh, what are the anti hypertensives you would think of in children with ag and monica uh, what are the safest ones ac inhibitors are ards beta blockers no particularly in acute glomerulonephritis this is uh, secondary hypertension right yes. secondary hypertension and this is labile hypertension as madam said you need not have hypertension all the time this could be uh, that is why you will have to constantly monitor the bp of these children in addition to your rft electrolytes and your intake output because once uh, the child can be hypertensive at one point of time and at another point of time it could, he could be normotensive so that is why you keep monitoring the bp at least twice when the child is in uh, the hospital okay so this this is labile hypertension so uh, what are the safest antibiotic this is a renal case yes, and um, what is the safest anti hypertensive i am repeating lifidipine very good so 
calcium channel blockers are the are preferred uh, as you said ac inhibitors they come second but there is a risk of hyperkalemia aka in this child okay so th those um, ac inhibitors they come second in the list the safest would be nifedipin it is given at a dose of 0.25 to uh, 0.5 mg per kg per dose okay uh these are not given uh just like a blanket uh, tds all that uh, you must keep monitoring and per dose you decide on how much it should be given okay then you can uh, think <coughs> of ac inhibitor though the uh, side effect of ac inhibitor could be hyperkalemia if the renal uh, function test of this child is apparently normal you can safely give okay so um, uh, then apart from that any centrally acting uh, anti hypertensive safe and this has been time tested alpha methyl dopa yes monica ma'am yes, then so the next would be if it is it is centrally acting and uh, centrally acting uh, anti hypertensives those are dicey because they can cause hypotension but still if uh, this uh, bp is refractory Uh, to calcium channel blockers and ac inhibitors you would think of centrally acting um, safe antihypertensives like alpha methyl dopa okay okay so uh, where what is the natural course of this uh, disease the mother is asking you uh, my child uh, has a renal uh, problem uh, what would be his future how would you prognosticate based on what Mama, based on what the PSGN, you'll tell the mother, uh, Papa, uh, sorry, I don't. This is an infection, and uh, he'll be okay. Or you will tell her that uh, this child will go in for uh, renal failure. Based on the urine output, and uh... no, the acute phase is over. You are discharging this child, okay? Or uh, you are in the plan to discharge this child. What are the symptoms you will expect to subside in this child? prior to discharging we can follow up so that you can prognosticate and tell them about the outcome urine output improves edema and uh, bp starts uh, to fall very good so the first thing that you would uh, expect in this child uh, is a fall in bp and subsidence of edema mm -hmm. okay so in one uh, or max two weeks time the bp and edema should come down okay so these two are the um uh, prominent symptoms which should subside okay which should become better when the child is in the hospital with uh, hypertension and with edema uh, you cannot discharge the child home so one to two weeks uh, the these symptoms will come down okay and uh, your uh, hematuria if it was gross hematuria you expect it to uh, improve <laughs> or uh, at least uh, become microscopic or uh, less hematuric by at least four weeks okay then the complement levels around 6 to 8 weeks they come back to normal and protein urea uh, by 8 weeks to 12 weeks it comes back to uh, normal okay so this is the normal course but microscopic hematuria can even persist wow. up to one year ma'am i blurted the answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i think they did you know that yes ma'am mm. yeah okay good safe okay so it can microscopic hematuria can persist up to one year okay so this is the natural course of a non complicated acute glomerulonephritis due to infectious etiology so if the uh, bp and edema does not settle by one to two weeks and if the macroscopic hematuria does not settle by four weeks and the complement levels do not come back to normalcy by 6 to 8 weeks and the protein urea it does not uh, normalize by 8 to 12 weeks you know you are in trouble and these are the indications mm -hmm. for biopsy so you know the natural course and if the disease does not follow the natural course then you will go in for a biopsy to know the etiology and the uh, pathology of the condition okay so to um, what are the indications for dialysis in these children uh, if the child goes for acute renal failure okay and uh, so renal. acute renal failure what are the parameters by which you know that the child has gone in for acute renal failure 
நம்ம யூரியான் இருக்கு யாருன்னா will be elevated and the bp will be high hypertension so persistent hypertensive ventriculopathy the child sensorium is not improving um then the child has persistent uh, uremia that could be the cause of uh, uremic ventriculopathy or the child has persistent hyperkalemia it is hyperkalemia causing uh, uh, cardiac disturbances all those uh, mandated dialysis if uh, refractory hyperkalemia okay suppose this child had got a history of uh, instead of the pyoderma the patient had come with puffiness some dark colored urine decreased urine output and then the mother says she has got some uh, fever with uh, mass uh, blood in stools for a week back or four five days back what would you think of then infection this four to five days back no Ah, a few days back, the child had bacillary dysentery. Followed that, back, followed by that, the child develops pallor. Child develops symptoms. Pardon? Hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uremic syndrome. Yeah. So you have to remember that AD, his past history of diarrhea, upper respiratory infection, as well as skin infections, parenthesis. All these have their own place in trying to get some clues towards the diagnosis. Okay. Do you want to ask something else? Um. I think she's done a good job, ma'am. Oh, for an, I mean, undergraduate, she's kind of covered it well, and she's probably understood it well. Good, Nandini. Congratulations. I mean, sorry, Monica. And actually, the other girls have also been doing a good job, Nandini and Sarah. Good. and you should all thank ma'am because she also took you very smoothly through the whole discussion and you definitely came to learn a few more things right both in examination as well as the discussion so that's that's really fantastic good thank you ma'am it was really nice actually uh, the way you took the whole uh, thing was really fantastic really nice well, thanks so much ma'am mm. my pleasure thanks to you to you just uh, i mean gave so much of space to me obviously because i be uh, the yeah. internal cannot ask them to very questions but i think the girls also did a good job good. yeah ma'am very true they have understood the um, concept of it uh, that is where uh, i mean for undergraduates it is uh, i mean i'm so impressed yeah it is definitely it's a good presentation by uh, uh, monica uh, okay so definitely a nice presentation huh? okay Uh, congrats doctor i think presented very well and uh, uh, internal as well as external now their uh, input is good okay i appreciate uh, dr kala and as well as uh, dr rashaini so for uh, past almost 1 hour uh, 20 minutes uh, it's excellent uh, uh, presentation as well as uh, uh, discussion also i thank uh, uh, all the students from the sarpagam uh, medical college who has participated for this um, wonderful uh, teaching program and uh, we will send a certificate to you and uh, uh, shortly uh, to your uh, email okay kindly send your uh, email address also i will send a, and uh, certificate from the uh, aptnsc huh? okay thank you sir thank you for the opportunity uh, thank you thank dr kala what your uh, feedback dr kala i think uh, we are frequently discuss with uh, dashani i think i want your feedback uh, how, what about this uh, classes uh, how is it really useful and uh, want any change of thing or any any feedback you want to tell no actually this is especially during this covid time this has been a godsend because i have found out that many of our students are also actually following them on youtube maybe not live because they have their own classes at this time but they okay. definitely revisit them so it's actually so like today uh, when i teach them something it is from my perspective what i think so today when somebody else uh, other teacher teaches it kind of opens a little more so it's really fantastic i'm sure the children also students also really appreciate it thank you so much sir right.
madam was also mean. not doing well and uh, she's managed to <laughs> yeah Ma you know that ma'am you were coughing throughout ah, and uh, yeah. it's so evident so much of fatigue but still yeah, you managed to sit yeah, yeah i'm having a, a acute exacerbation today the cold oh. weather yeah but uh, that's okay fine but anyway right. thank you so much yeah thank the main you, aim of uh, yeah main aim of uh, presentation uh, this kind of uh, ug classes one thing is the various teachers all over uh, uh, tamil nadu know how they are taking classes uh, and how, what's their frequent questions the, what are their expectation from the students i think it definitely will be a, a useful for the students that's the main motive to start this program i think from the january onwards what